Hi, everyone. Good morning and good afternoon. I'm Derek Chalet with GMF in Washington, and it's my great pleasure uh, to welcome all of you to this conversation with Michael Kimmage on his new book just out, The Abandonment of the West, The History of an Idea in American Foreign Policy. And we're very thrilled uh, to have Michael join us today for this virtual book talk. Uh, I know it's an unusual time, Michael, to be rolling out uh, a new book um, in this new virtual world that, that we are all living in, uh, but we're thrilled to have you here. We're, we're, we're very thrilled that all of you are joining us uh, today, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. Michael is a professor of history at Catholic University of America here in Washington. Uh, he is a former State Department official serving on the policy planning staff. Uh, and also, we're very proud that he's been a longtime member of the GMF family uh, here in Washington. Uh, he's been with us in multiple capacities and remains a non-resident fellow with us. Uh, so, Michael, welcome. Congratulations on the book. Uh, Michael and I will talk uh, for the first 20, 30 minutes or so in conversation, and then we'll open up the conversation to all of you uh, with questions. And we're going to be using the Q&A function on uh, the Zoom system. So uh, if you have a question, just load it up, uh, get in the queue, and we will get to it uh, uh, when we turn to you. Uh, thank you. So Michael, uh, when, uh, I guess first, what is, what is the West? Uh, when did we abandon it and why? Well, first of all, I want to thank you for hosting this event, Derek. And and the GMF team for setting it up. And it's a perfect occasion to thank the GMF for all of the support uh, over the years, which was, was crucial to the writing of this book. So uh, that's where I'd like to begin. Uh, and then uh, I can jump in with your three small questions, Derek, about what the West is, um, uh, you know, sort of, uh, and, and when some of the problems uh, began uh, and what we can understand by the abandonment uh, of the West as, as I titled my book. So. First thing to say is if, if one is in a sort of scholarly sense very serious about it, the West means probably a thousand different things. Uh, so it's defined in multiple ways. Um, it's uh, often contradictory how it's defined and these uh, ways uh, change uh, considerably over time. So it's a fluid uh, and highly difficult uh, uh, to define concept. So I'll offer you the definition that's the working definition in the book. Uh, and this is the one that to me is most useful for understanding American foreign policy and, uh, and American political culture. So we would never want to claim that this is the exclusive definition, but this is the one that I've uh, gone with. And this is uh, a narrative uh, of, of liberty, uh, self-government, uh, uh, democracy, if you will, uh, that's understood as uh, importantly transatlantic. Uh, and that in the 20th century uh, has taken on uh, more than just narrative meaning. Uh, it took a while for this to build up, but uh, by the 1930s and 1940s, this was uh, a foreign policy project as well, which had a security component uh, and an institutional component uh, that linked uh, Europe and the United States. And um, add one other point in terms of definitions, uh, I divide my analysis between what I call the messianic impulse uh, and the legal impulse or multilateral uh, impulse. And these are both there in American foreign policy. They're not uh, identical. They collide at times. Sometimes you have a president, you might look at George W. Bush in this case, who sort of begins one way uh, and ends up another way. Uh, but uh, the way in which the West has sort of animated different presidents and secretaries of state uh, has alternately been sort of forward looking, uh, you know, sort of robust. Uh, perhaps aggressive in the eyes of America's critics, uh, that's on the one hand, uh, and then sort of legalistic and cooperative uh, on the other. Uh, let me mention just one point about uh, a sort of fragmentation uh, and then speak a little bit about abandonment uh, and uh, we can return to your questions, Derek, uh, your other questions. So in terms of uh, fragmentation, I think it begins uh, really quite early. It begins before the Vietnam War. Vietnam War is the most important break in terms of uh, the American connection uh, to the West and foreign policy. But prior to that, you have, uh, in fact, on the right, uh, a questioning of uh, the official commitment to the West uh, by figures like James Burnham 
uh, and, and others who see the problem not just as the West versus the Soviet Union, which was the standard way of looking at things uh, in the 1960s, but see American liberals as, as, the, pro as the problem or as part of the problem, as, as uh, people who are sort of not honoring uh, the Western commitments. And Burnham puts that out in a 1964 book. It's very much an outlier at the time, that book. Uh, but that sort of uh, could say culture war frame for looking at the West, where the divisions, the really meaningful divisions are the internal ones, uh, that begins already in the 1960s, pre-Vietnam, kicks into high gear with figures like Patrick Buchanan uh, in the 1990s, uh, and of course is very much with us uh, at the present moment. At the same time, you have on the American left, particularly in the university world, uh, a sort of increasing questioning of the West, um, an alignment of the West with empire uh, and with the retrograde politics uh, of race and a sense that really to move forward as a society be to become properly multicultural, we have to get beyond uh, the West. Uh, and that too, I guess you could say, starts in the 1960s, but doesn't really start to be felt until the 1980s. Uh, and so uh, in ways that are fascinating to observe as a historian, uh, there is uh, either a sort of very vibrant debate, that would be one way of looking at it, or a fragmentation that's occurring uh, but it's over the last four or five decades. It's certainly not, not over the last four, four or five years. Well, uh, so get to the question of sort of when did it, I mean, why was it abandoned? I mean, was it, was it uh, you know, how did, the, how did the, this intellectual debate, which this book is a very rich intellectual history, uh, I think providing a lot, of, uh, a lot of kind of the intellectual architecture behind uh, debates we've been having in American foreign policy uh, for many decades. Uh, why was it abandoned? Um, and and I think maybe jumping ahead a bit, how may it be uh, re reconstituted? So the abandonment, I think, is is uh, is sort of twofold, um, and one source of abandonment of the West, and I'll reiterate my definition of it in a moment because that will help to, I think, explain the abandonment of the West as I, uh, as I define it. But one source of the abandonment was a, a certain sense of shame uh, or embarrassment or alternately a feeling that what American foreign policy had to be was truly global. Uh, so this is something that's not uh, exclusive to the Obama administration, although it was, I think, an attitude of the Obama administration. It goes back to uh, the 1990s. U.S. faces global responsibilities it's a multicultural society. The issues that we have ahead of us are largely economic, uh, not civilizational. Uh, and uh, so we need a different uh, frame. Uh, and that frame became, uh, in the Obama administration, the liberal international order, which has many commonalities with the West as I've defined it. It's committed to law, it's committed to, uh, to democracy, to liberty, to all of those things, but it certainly doesn't call itself the West. And I think it was felt to be more uh, flexible in a sense, more tolerant than uh, than the word West might uh, uh, than the word West might su suggest, uh, and you know we can get into the Obama administration perhaps uh, in a moment. But I think that was one reason, if not explicitly, to abandon the West to sort of put it a bit into the background uh, and uh, and not to harp on it. Whereas on the right, the West has always been popular. Uh, usually, conservatives see themselves as, by definition, advocates or fans. Uh, of the West, but it's the definition of the West that I use that gets uh, abandoned by certain constituents, constituencies on the right. And so go back to Pat Buchanan for a moment. He sees the enemies uh, of the West as the European Union, as multilateralism, as globalization. Uh, and so the things that he puts forward to save the West are sort of um, curtailing immigration and a, a resurgence of patriotism and nationalism. Uh, and clearly those become the themes of the Trump campaign in 2016. Uh, and in complicated ways have been themes uh, of the Trump uh, presidency. So in that sense, uh, these two uh, uh, sort of uh, moments of questioning uh, that begin in the 1960s and 70s, you could say come to fruition uh, in recent years. The way I think to go forward uh, is in my view, not to abandon the concept of the West, although it has a lot of baggage uh, and a lot of dark sides and those need to be addressed and acknowledged uh, directly and carefully, but I think it's a tradition worth uh, worth keeping. Uh, and you know, I think the transatlantic relationship can sort of be revived uh, in and of itself. That's maybe a policy concern, uh, but if we're going to do that for the long term, what we really need to focus on is culture, uh, and we have to think of ways to make the West viable uh, for the culture of the 21st century. Uh, 
Uh, you have to make it multicultural uh, and tolerant, sort of forward-looking, uh, I think experimental. Um, there has to be an effort uh, to engage the culture. You know, it's a famous phrase from Breitbart, Andrew Breitbart, that politics lies downstream from culture. I think foreign policy lies downstream from culture as well. We should take that uh, to heart and sort of think about the ways we can come up with a viable uh, and attractive 21st century uh, West. But it can't be done on the plane of policy alone. It has to be done in tandem with culture. Well, I, I'd like to get into that in a bit. What I'd like to do now is go back to the beginning uh, and, the, and the origin of the idea of the West. And you start your book uh, in a very interesting place, uh, the Columbia, the World Columbian Ex Ex Exposition of 1893. And you, you say uh, in this book that that's the story, uh, that's where the story of the West and American foreign policy begins. And you define something called the Columbian Republic. Yes. So if you could talk to us about the, the World Columbian Exposition of 1893, why it's important, uh, and then also what that what the Colombian Republic means. Well, um, it's it's rather an extraordinary moment, 1893, uh, in American life, uh, and uh, it's it's sort of beautifully captured by the Colombian Exposition in Chicago, meant to celebrate the 400th anniversary of Columbus's voyage. They just got one year off uh, uh, for logistical reasons, but uh, it was a celebration of Colombia, which is something that you see across. 19th century American culture, from the naming of the city of Washington in the District of Columbia to Columbia University, uh, to many sort of rivers, towns, uh, and places that are named uh, after Columbus. So this was par for the course for the 19th century, and it was, um, you know, sort of the highest pitch of this moment of enthusiasm for Columbus. Columbus was uh, the figure who united Europe uh, and the United States in the eyes of the organizers of the fair, and the U.S. had what they felt were the Colombian virtues. It was experimental, it was exploratory, it was sort of bold, outward looking, uh, and all of that was celebrated at the fair. So on one level, what you see is the U.S. is sort of announcing itself to the world as a great power. And that was, I think, objectively the case in the 1890s. By military and economic standards, the U.S. was really emerging uh, as a very formidable force. And that's one of the things that the, uh, the fair wanted to communicate, but in ways that are I think very problematic from our vantage point, and it goes back to your question about how we can reconstitute the West and why multiculturalism and tolerance are uh, crucial to today's story. Uh, the World's Fair was um, almost exclusively a celebration of white American culture. Uh, it was very close to a celebration of empire in the age of European uh, imperialism. Uh, those who were non-white were sort of relegated to the margins uh, of the fair. Uh, and there was, uh, this is an era, of course, of segregation. Uh, and so in a sense, that's not surprising, but that's very much part of the picture uh, as well. So it's a point of origin. It suggests uh, the existence, certainly, of this Euro-American narrative. Uh, you do have motifs of liberty and self-government that are there in the speeches, uh, but it's also draped by sort of imperial pomp uh, and the racial politics of it uh, are the racial politics of the time. Uh, and. Uh, uh, are really quite brutal. So you have all of the ingredients there and you have all of the complexity there at the very beginning. So the Colombian Republic. The Colombian Republic is a place that sees itself as important, uh, that sees itself as, uh, as uh, moving forward technologically. So the construction of the Panama Canal, which is decided upon not long after the Colombian uh, fair is the sort of uh, aspect of this, uh, of this, uh, of this project. Uh, and uh, you have the Spanish-American War. Uh, at the end of the decade, Woodrow Wilson has a terrific quote about the Spanish-American War that never had the U.S. entered into the world stage in quite the way that it did uh, with this war. Nothing brought it into the world uh, stage. So there's self-consciousness, which you can see in the early republic, but there it's sort of delusional about how important the United States is. That self-consciousness is really developing. What is the U.S. US going to do on the world stage? Uh, and I can offer you one sort of further complexity or contradiction about the Colombian Republic, which is certainly that it sees itself as democratic uh, and is inching its way toward a foreign policy that would be pro-democratic. Uh, but of course, it's also become a formal empire in the 1890s uh, and is playing the game of European great power politics much more robustly than the United States ever wished to do uh, before. So there's this question, which I think is easy to ask about the Colombian Republic, uh, is its might and power, which is self-evident, 
Is it going to be used in the name of democracy? Is it going to be used in the name of empire? And as I argue in the book, the foreign policy presidents of this period or the, the practitioners of foreign policy don't resolve the question. They pose the question of what the U.S. is going to be. Uh, they pose a couple of interesting answers, but they're not able to resolve it. And the last figure that comes uh, in this uh, first part of the book is, is Woodrow Wilson, who answers the question on the side of democracy, but is unable to convince the American population to go along with him. Yeah, cause it's interesting. I mean, in many ways, this is a story of failure. Uh, and why, why were our leaders unable to resolve this question? Well, uh, I think part of it was uh, uh, the sheer power of Europe at the time, uh, even with the First World War. Uh, that there's, uh, you know, it's almost necessary that you have the Second World War to bring the U.S. Uh, forward in that respect. And until 1945, it's Europeans who are going to answer uh, to European political realities. And I, I think that they weren't all that interested in, uh, in what the U.S. had to say. Uh, and then there are these internal um, you know, sort of doubts about uh, the merits of a very outward looking foreign policy, which are of course familiar to us uh, from the present moment, 1920s and 1930s, uh, 1920s on the side of Republican presidents who think that the business of America is business and look back at the First World War as a mistake uh, and a failure. And then Franklin Roosevelt was preoccupied uh, until 1941 with the Great Depression and with uh, domestic, uh, domestic problems. So you see a growing will to act on the world. You see a sort of program and agenda that's forming, uh, especially with Woodrow Wilson uh, and you know, Truman and FDR and many uh, in the mid-century are going to be students of Woodrow Wilson. So the impact is uh, over time enormous, uh, but the conditions are not really right for uh, um, uh, the U.S. to act in Europe until you have the Second World War and all the problems that it creates. Uh, and then, of course, the Cold War is another chapter, but uh, uh, in the absence of the Second World War and the Cold War, the U.S. had a lot of interesting ideas, uh, but it really wasn't in the position to, to, to implement them overseas. Mm -hmm. um, Michael, going back to the, uh, the Columbian Exposition, one of the very interesting things about this book is the way that you weave architecture. And I used the word ar architecture earlier, thinking about intellectual architecture, which you actually, actually talk a lot about the build the buildings and memorials and government institutions uh, and city planning uh, and as that is an expression of the West and important to American foreign policy and I think that's one of the real uh, enriching things of this book uh, for, for for folks who think a lot about foreign policy is you're there you force us to think differently about about things we normally don't consider when we talk about foreign policy debates um, and I think that's a real contribution here. Um, so I'd like to hear from you a little bit more about why you became so interested in architecture, uh, uh, how you think it matters to your story, and specifically talk about something that it's a recurring thread throughout the book, uh, something called the Macmillan Plan. I'll like, ta tell our sure. listeners, uh, viewers, what, what that is and why it matters. So the Chicago World's Fair was a uh, a major event uh, of the 1890s globally, very popular uh, and in, you know, enormous attendance and a, and a signature event, but it was also pretty quickly forgotten. It left us with perhaps Blue Ribbon Beer and Cracker Jacks and enduring aspects of American culture that were innovated at the fair, but the buildings were taken down and, uh, uh, and the city of Chicago uh, moved on. The most important legacy of the fair, if we're gonna speak about buildings and architecture and eventually about narrative and politics and foreign policy, the most important important legacy is what it did for Washington, D.C. So D.C. is this provincial, um, you know, sort of quite ugly and almost catastrophic city in some respects in the 19th century. I quote from Charles Dickens who goes and uh, calls it the city of magnificent intentions. The reality leaves uh, a lot to be desired. The National Mall, what we know of as the mall now, was a, a series of train tracks and Pennsylvania Avenue was a mess. Uh, and it was really an unbecoming city for, uh, for the country, but certainly an unbecoming city for uh, an aspiring superpower. And so what happened was that the architects of the Chicago World's Fair put together a proposal for Washington, D.C., as architects often do, and miraculously, Congress took them up on it, and it was the Senator McMillan who championed this, so it became known as the McMillan Plan. I think it was confirmed in 1902. Uh, and this really created the city of Washington as we know it. So no national mall, really, without uh, the McMillan Plan. We cleared the train tracks, built Union Station, 1908, um, you know, made 
it possible to build the National Gallery of Art and the Smithsonian, all these buildings that we uh, uh, think of as sort of organically part of the city. This was a choice then. Uh, and the aesthetic of this was neoclassical. So on the one hand, this goes back to things I was saying earlier about empire and a certain uh, perhaps American desire to imitate European empire, but that's not really how it worked on the National Mall. The ethos was to be democratic. Uh, and the idea behind it was a sort of Western celebration of Western heritage on the one hand, uh, through neoclassical architecture, but a celebration of democracy on the other. So in that sense, Washington does what most European capitals uh, don't do, the sort of open space is the way in which the mall uh, is a place that's intended for demonstrations uh, and, and, uh, and protests. Also, the presence of museums and libraries on the National Mall goes back to a Jeffersonian idea of democracy that without education, uh, without knowledge, without erudition, uh, democracy is going to be in dire straits. So there's a narrative that's there on the Mall. It comes from the Macmillan Plan. Uh, and it's Western uh, in important ways. Uh, and at the same time, uh, it's, uh, it's democratic. And of course, this feeds in any number of ways into American foreign policy in the 1940s uh, and 1950s. Although I'll, I'll add as a footnote that I um, you know, take some pot shots at the State Department building, uh, which is finished in 1960 for, uh, not necessarily for, for deviating from this norm because it's good for architecture to develop and grow, uh, but it does, does so little of that sort of thing. It tells no story. Uh, there's no narrative in the State Department building. It's a pretty functional a uh, decent building, but it's wiped itself clean of ornament and text and statuary uh, and sort of taken itself out of the narrative, which seems uh, a shame to me. So um, uh, that's uh, part of the story as well. The Quillen Plan does a lot, but uh, you know, DC travels in different directions after the Quillen hmm. Plan comes into effect. But yet you do point out how there's, there's this architectural influence of the West clearly on our embassy construction. Yes, yes, that's... Uh, uh, that's extremely important. Uh, and uh, again, it's sort of these representative functions uh, uh, of, of the US uh, and sort of what it represents, what it stands for. Uh, and uh, that ethos is, 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 is very important and builds upon uh, patterns that are set really in the early 19th century with the construction of the White House and Congress uh, and even Capitol Hill spelled with an O, which is meant to make us think of the Capitoline Hill uh, in Rome, all of these sort of echoes uh, and resonances that have been built into American civic architecture. Uh, and that matters uh, greatly for diplomacy, to be sure. Um, I know we've got some questions coming in and I wanna get to those and please continue to uh, send in questions. Uh, I've got a few more things I'd like to talk about. Um, first, one of the things I think, again, that's very interesting about this book and, and quite revealing is uh, different individuals that you, you focus on uh, as important players in this story of, of the evolution of the idea of the West. And some of these uh, individuals are familiar to foreign policy professionals. Some uh, uh, are normally are not thought of in a discussion about US foreign policy. And I think you importantly bring them into this discussion. So I'm going to mention a few cohorts and I'd like you to talk a little bit about them, but then also why they matter to your story. Uh, so let me start with Malcolm X and W.E.B. E. Dubois. Yes, well, um, these are two giants of, of, of 20th century American history. And, uh, and, and, and Du Bois was uh, an early analyst and critic of the West starting in the 1890s. He gives a commencement address as a Harvard undergraduate uh, in which he takes up these themes already then. Uh, and devotes himself uh, to historical and, and sociology research uh, on the slave trade, on American history, on European history. Uh, and he's harshly critical, uh, very understandably, of the age of empire. And he sees the US as, as sort of rushing headlong into the age of empire uh, in the 1890s and early 20th century. Uh, du Bois is also significant because he makes a case for the humanities. He has a famous passage in a book called The Souls of Black Folk, which I believe is 1902 which he says, I sit down with Aristotle and Plato and Shakespeare and they wince not. Uh, so he was happy in some respects to, to claim the Western cultural uh, tradition as his, but he was very critical of the politics uh, of, uh, of his moment. Uh, and that only intensified over time. He sends a petition in 1947 to the UN uh, on behalf of African-American citizens uh, asking for equal rights and then eventually um, it joins the Communist Party and dies uh, in exile, but is certainly among the most coaching critics of American foreign policy uh, 
uh, who's ever uh, who's ever lived and has uh, had enormous uh, influence on historical scholarship and academic work uh, for the last 30, 40, uh, 50 years. Malcolm X uh, wasn't a scholar, uh, but uh, he was a galvanizing public speaker uh, in the 1950s and 60s, and it was striking to me going back to his uh, books and speeches how often he spoke about the West. Uh, he converted to Islam when he was uh, in prison. Uh, he felt that Christianity and the West were not for him, uh, and really shouldn't be for any African Americans. Uh, and he wanted to see a, 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 in America, I don't think that he had much optimism about this, but he wanted to see an America that was uh, on the side of the, uh, of the colonized peoples uh, that would move on to the other, move its enthusiasm or move its sympathies to the other side of the color line. Uh, and he spoke uh, uh, intensively on those subjects uh, prior to the Vietnam War, assassinated before the Vietnam War uh, has really taken off. Uh, but uh, in the public sphere, he too is a very cogent critic of American foreign policy precisely because it is affiliated with the West. So Du Bois and, and Malcolm X matter uh, uh, for their eloquence uh, and for the way in which they expand the discussion uh, of the West. Uh, I don't think that they were listened to by the makers of foreign policy in their time, uh, but uh, uh, that's maybe another story, but they are these two eloquent voices that help us to understand uh, the most important critiques of the West and of an American foreign policy that's grounded in the West. And certainly had a tremendous impact uh, at the time, but especially over time on our culture. Uh, indeed, indeed. Two other, two other figures that, that helped shape the thinking about uh, America and the world, Edward Said and Alan Bloom. Yes. Uh, this is a, uh, a sort of natural and somewhat comic pairing. Uh, I'm not sure if they ever met. They would have hated each other probably, uh, or maybe not. But uh, um, Ibrit Said was uh, born in Mandate, Palestine, uh, to a father who had American citizenship, came and studied uh, in the U.S. Uh, already in, in sort of high school years, uh, and then became a superstar professor of literature uh, at Columbia. He uh, his, his heritage was... Uh, was was Arab, uh, and this made him feel, uh, in many ways, like an outsider uh, in the United States. And he writes this extraordinary book in 1979 called, called Orientalism. Uh, and this is a critique, really, of British and French uh, scholarship and intellectual life and culture for abetting uh, empire uh, and for uh, denigrating people who are not uh, of the West. But importantly, Said folds the United States into that and basically says the book was published, as I said, 1979 that the new imperial power is the United States. And so we need the framework, the same critical framework we had for European empire is what we should be applying to American foreign policy. Again, I don't think State Department, National Security Council circles uh, were that much influenced by Edward Said. I mentioned later on that uh, Barack Obama studied with Said and thought he was a flake uh, and didn't take him all that seriously. Um, but for the university world, Said is an absolutely transformative figure. So he sets the tone for the humanities uh, for uh, for, for, for decades after 1979. And Alan Bloom is sort of his perfect foil, a University of Chicago professor uh, who wrote a blockbuster book of 1987, The Closing of the American Mind, which is not really about foreign policy, but about university curricula. And it's a lament for uh, a sort of waning commitment to the West and, and, and loss of faith in Western ideals, which Bloom interestingly defines uh, as democracy, uh, but the very final paragraph of that book is this is the American moment in the world, so all of these issues matter, how we define ourselves, how we define uh, our culture, our universities are going to matter precisely because the U.S. Is a, uh, is a superpower. So Bloom is linking, actually like Said, he's sort of linking these uh, worlds of the university and of ideas to foreign policy, but Bloom does it as somebody who wants to see the West succeed, and, 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 and Said does it as somebody who wants to see the West evaporate. So the last two uh, individuals I'd like you to talk a little bit about are more are more familiar to American foreign policy thinkers, one more so than perhaps the other. Walt Rostow, who is a prominent academic and policymaker, national security advisor to President Johnson, and Sam Samuel Huntington. Yeah, these are I think very helpful figures. The two of them. Uh, I think help me maybe help us to understand the complexity of the West as it functions in American foreign policy. So Rostow was, was an economist, a brilliant economist at MIT who became uh, director of policy planning and had you know, sort of other important government jobs. Uh, and he wrote this book, The Stages of Growth. And 
was, uh, I think, a friend of John F. Kennedy's. Uh, and Rostow had a, a wonderfully technocratic idea of the West. Uh, it was an economics process. It was about prosperity. It was about the structures, the social structures uh, that create prosperity. In that sense, communism is maybe bad in and of itself, but it's really bad because it blocks uh, economic growth. Uh, and uh, he worked out a model which um, was going to bring the whole world forward, uh, sort of along Western lines, uh, but again, uh, in a kind of remarkably uh, technocratic, uh, technocratic fashion. He's, of course, remembered for his robust advocacy of, uh, of the American war in Vietnam and, and, and for other reasons, but I'm fascinated by his uh, sort of modeling of Western development and uh, his application of these ideas to the domain uh, of economics. Those models, I think, are very much still uh, with us. They've never, uh, they've never gone away, even if Rostow's star fell because of Vietnam. Huntington is, is kind of the opposite. So he writes uh, a book, The Clash of Civilizations, 1996. Uh, and intriguingly, he defines a civilization as religious. That's not the definition I've used in my book. Uh, it brings Huntington certain dividends, uh, but he sort of slices the world up into different uh, religions. Uh, it's the world of Christianity, the world of Islam, the world of Confucianism. Uh, and he makes the prediction that uh, geopolitical crises are gonna sort of follow, follow these civilizational division points and dividing lines. So that brought the book a special kind of currency uh, after September 11th. But uh, I see Huntington as a little bit of an outlier in the 1990s. I think he saw himself uh, that way. Uh, and I think he almost had fun uh, sort of arguing for Western civilization because he knew it was unpopular with his academic uh, colleagues. But the Rostow Huntington pairing to me is intriguing in that both are fans of the West, uh, but they define it totally differently. Economics on the one hand, religion uh, on the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Michael, you, you also talk a lot about administrations. You talk about Woodrow Wilson, uh, Obama. Uh, talk about how uh, different presidents have approached this, this challenge. Wh what are some of the ones that to you stand out uh, in, in this story? And I guess, which ones have uh, surprised you perhaps in the journey of writing the book? Sure. Uh, you you thought you found your found yourself thinking differently about uh, how they engaged uh, some of these debates. Well, let me mention uh, five: uh, Eisenhower, JFK, um, uh, Reagan, uh, Obama, and Trump. All of whom have very very provocative and interesting things to say about uh, uh, about the West. So Eisenhower, to me. He emerges, if I can be so candid, as the protagonist of, of the book, really, I never say this directly, but I think of him that way because he merges these different worlds. Uh, he merges, merges the world of military leadership in the Second World War. He then becomes president of Columbia University, so he has ties to uh, the academic world, and then, of course, uh, two-term American president. Uh, and he was committed to the West in each of those three vocations, the military, the academic, uh, and, uh, and the presidential. Uh, and Eisenhower is also a hero in the book in the sense that he mastered the art of bipartisanship. Uh, I think he was, as American presidents go, probably uh, as effectively bipartisan uh, as any of them. And that, if American foreign policy is thriving in those years, sort of late 40s, 50s, uh, I think it's in part the bipartisanship of American foreign policy that, uh, that helps to explain that. But that was, uh, to a degree, Eisenhower's uh, doing. I think JFK just inherited a sort of Western foreign policy. I don't think he innovated it, but JFK's advantage, uh, which Eisenhower didn't have, was his public speaking. Uh, and so the very middle point of the book is the speech that Kennedy gives in 1963 in West Berlin, uh, where he doesn't just say, Ich bin ein Berliner, he says, Civis Romanus Sum, these sort of Latin phrases uh, alluding to citizenship. Uh, and he puts both Germany and the US on this narrative of Western. Uh, liberty in West Berlin and um, you know the speech was by the standards of its time enormously uh, effective so JFK had the ability to, to sort of vocalize to articulate uh, to big crowds uh, what all of this was about uh, and to do so uh, effectively Reagan is to me interesting I think Reagan had similar talents in terms of public speaking and so I mentioned of course his 1987 speech at the Berlin Wall but with Reagan something is starting to shift going here from Eisenhower to Reagan, Reagan's more partisan in the way that he approaches the West. It's a more conservative project for him. And in that sense, you see more religion uh, in Reagan, and there's a bit of a party political element, which I don't think is, uh, is so much there before. So something of the partisan divide of our own times starts to become palpable 
uh, in uh, in the 1980s. Uh, but uh, Reagan also had, of course, those lyrical skills. Obama speak very briefly, of course, one could go into great detail about the topic, uh, I think had great successes with the Western Orient for, Western oriented foreign policy uh, as I've defined it, but he does change the terminology somewhat and uses the phrase the liberal international order, uh, which does a lot of helpful cultural work in a way, takes out the baggage of the West and makes it more versatile, in a sense, more technocratic, maybe echoes of Walt Rostow uh, here. Uh, but the problem with Obama, if you can blame him for this, I'm not sure one can, but one can make the observation. Uh, the problem, I think, is what happened domestically. Uh, and I think the, a lot of the American population didn't understand what this foreign policy was about. Uh, and there wasn't enough cultural meaning. So what you gain by losing baggage, you can kind of lose in a, in a, uh, in a different sense. And when you get to 2016, I think um, uh, it was hard in the public sphere in the course of that election to make a good case. Uh, for the liberal international order, which brings us to Trump, who is the biggest surprise of my book. I started it in 2012 with no inkling of what was to come because he brings really a new West to the table. There's no American president who's ever spoken of the West uh, as Trump has. Uh, he defines it, uh, he sort of takes democracy uh, and that narrative out of the equation. Uh, he minimizes the transatlantic component uh, to the West or he localizes it to places like Poland uh, and Hungary. Uh, and there's more of a sort of ethnic, uh, or at times sort of ethnic religious uh, identity to the West than you see uh, with any previous 20th century American president. And of course, the partisanship that's there with Trump is visible with, uh, with Reagan, but it's, it's already extreme by the time you get to, to Trump. So the trajectory, to conclude the point, from Eisenhower to Trump is one of very, very dramatic change and development over time. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I you know, you would, Obama certainly attempted to uh, put a cultural refrain, frame around his idea of a liberal international order uh, that certainly was a, it com would compete with the 2016, the Trump frame. Um, clearly that was not successful or it fell short. Uh, you know, this leads to the next question I had, which is, you, I've finished this book uh, long before our current uh, uh, crisis, which arguably the most profound crisis the U.S. has faced uh, at least since the, you know, World War I and II, if not, if not more so, depending on how this plays out. And, and how do you see this crisis affect the, the, the arguments you're making about how perhaps the West could be revived? And by crisis, Derek, you mean the sort of corona crisis? Yeah, and... corona crisis, the, the global Great Depression we're probably heading into. Um, you know, how, th there's a debate, there's an argument in the New York Times today uh, talking about how this, the crisis and America's response to the crisis thus far is impacting the idea of American exceptionalism, the self-identity of many Americans. Um, and of course, one could see an, one way out of it, which is this is a rebirth, that the response to the U.S. crisis, this crisis for many Americans reminds of the importance of many of the, of the good things the idea of the West has brought about mm -hmm. while acknowledging many of the, of the bad things that have come along with it. Just curious how you see this, uh, these arguments playing out in, in this crisis, where in many ways we're more aware than ever that we all live in one world, uh, uh, but at the same time, many of the impulses that uh, that drove much of the drama of the 20th century, nationalism, uh, uh, protectionism, um, you know, fear of the other are also coming roaring back. So uh, let me make uh, maybe two separate points. And one goes back to the 1990s and to what I think was a intellectual mistake that was made in the 1990s after the end of the Cold War. Uh, there was a powerful assumption after the end of the Cold War that democracy, liberal forms of government were inevitably victorious. They were the stronger forces because the Soviet Union had collapsed. They were sort of self-regulating mechanisms. There was a heady optimism in those, uh, in those years. And the question with the countries like Russia and China wasn't whether they would become democratic in the 1990s. The question was really when. Uh, and that was, uh, I think one can say in retrospect, the wrong question. Uh, I think liberty, self-government, uh, one wants to go back to the 30s to reinforce the point, one certainly can, but liberty, self-government, even in good times, like the 1990s, uh, are fragile things. 
uh, that's, uh, they're always in danger of sort of passing between our fingers. Uh, and so if we've been hit with pessimism in the last five to 10 years, let's say in the wake of the failure of the Arab Spring and lots of global turmoil, and of course, Corona has kicked that into high gear. If we're now pessimistic about things and we've been confronted with the fragility of democratic institutions and democratic norms, I'm not sure that that's a bad thing. That may be in fact the education we needed um, because without vigilance, without a desire to sustain these things uh, and uh, to embody them, to represent them domestically and in foreign policy, uh, they will uh, fade away and they will yield to uh, what seem at the moment like very self-confident uh, authoritarian governments that are not signed on to the Western uh, projects. So I don't find um, the sort of turmoil and the chaos uh, in every respect bad at the moment. And I think in some ways it may open our eyes to the high stakes of things and remind us of what's, uh, of what's, uh, of what's, truly, uh, of what's truly important. Uh, that's, uh, uh, I think, uh, a, a sort of fundamental point. Uh, secondly, um, and I feel like there's been a sort of collective failure in this regard, uh, it is very important to link the corona crisis, however it will play itself out, uh, to issues of, 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 of political form uh, and political uh, content. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know if, if the corona crisis will serve authoritarian governments. That's one line of argument uh, at the moment, but that's the kind of thing that we should be looking very carefully at. And I think, you know, Washington has been asleep at the wheel in terms of this and has not really stood up for democratic forms of government in Europe since 2016. So that's not a huge surprise. Uh, but even Angela Merkel, who one imagines is very committed to these things, you know, Hungary goes in an authoritarian direction and she seems either too busy or sort of too preoccupied with German affairs uh, to get very involved. So if we let that sort of negligence develop, and we're only at the early stages of this crisis, as you say, sort of global depression, and all of the things that, that can unleash, uh, that negligence will be very costly. So these two points amount to the sort of same point that uh, uh, hard times call for uh, call for vigilance. Uh, I haven't seen too much of that on evidence at the moment, but, uh, you know, uh, I don't finish the book and don't myself feel pessimistic about these things. I just think that it's necessary, necessary to make the case. Uh, and so this is a good time to be making the case for these principles. That's right. And, you know, it's, it's always important for uh, Americans to remind themselves that after previous moments of national trauma, whether it was the Civil War in the 1860s, World War II, of course, in the 40s, uh, even the tumult of the 1960s, we had very important social change uh, for the better uh, after each uh, traumatic episode. Uh, I want to transition to the, to the Q&A uh, and build on one, one very selfish final question I had, and this gets to the issue of culture. You, you end your book uh, on American foreign policy uh, in, a, in an unusual and I think very powerful way, and it's focusing on, going back to this issue of memorial and architecture, focusing on uh, the African American Museum uh, here in Washington on the National Mall. And this folds into a question that Susan Stewart from SWP has, which is this question of, of how the, your focus on culture in making the West fit for the 21st century and she asked which actors would ideally be involved in this attempt and, and what the transatlantic component of that uh, effort would be. So if you could touch on your, your the cultural touchstone you end the book with, the, the African American yes. Museum uh, on, the, on the mall, the History Museum on the mall with Susan's question. Sure, well, uh, I end the book with a description of the, of the construction of the African American History Museum, the Smithsonian, uh, on the mall, in part because it feels like uh, a very positive example of what can uh, be done to create a 21st either equivalent uh, or example uh, of the West in the sense that this museum celebrates the core Western principles that are celebrated across the mall, liberty, self-government, the franchise, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, culminating point is the election of an African-American president uh, in that museum, but uh, that's the narrative that's developed, but it doesn't do so with another white marble building uh, on the mall, the building is distinctive. It modifies the way that we think about the mall, very close to the Washington and Jefferson memorials. Both of those men, of course, were slaveholders. And so it's in dialogue with those memorials, with those historical figures. Uh, and it's also a place where Washingtonians and the rest of the country and visitors to Washington from around the world, it's really where they want to go. Uh, that's the museum where they want to be. So it has currency, uh, it has energy. I think the principles that I'm discussing in the book are all uh, uh, mirrored in that uh, building and at the same time it does it in a new way. It even has 
a connection back to the Macmillan plan in the sense that there was supposed to be an African American museum as a part of sort of offshoot of the Macmillan plan. It didn't get built and sort of got forgotten about, but you can see this as uh, a fulfillment of the Macmillan plan of the kind that wouldn't have been conceivable in the 1890s. So I think that that's where I end the book and I try to do it in a way that's not, I hope, crudely optimistic, but uh, uh, sort of cautiously or guardedly uh, optimistic. In terms of how to defend these things, since the question comes from Europe, let me speak a little bit in just policy terms when I look at this from Europe. I think Europe should be engaging in very rigorous and uh, uh, and, and serious cultural diplomacy in the US. So not just uh, uh, celebrating the EU and Washington DC, but comprehensive plans to make the case for the transatlantic relationship uh, in rural American communities, in the, in the sort of heartlands and places where there may not be that much uh, contact with Europeans or that much knowledge about, uh, about the European Union or the European project, the, you know, the sort of values and interests that are embedded in the transatlantic relationship. It goes back to what I was saying a moment ago. These are not self-regulating machines. They're not gonna just keep on going forever. Uh, the transatlantic relationship needs a huge amount of work. We have you know, our job in the US to do. That's one conversation, but I would urge uh, Europeans close to policymakers to think of the US as, as legitimate an object of cultural diplomacy as Russia or China or places that are considered to be a geopolitical you know, sort of menace to Europe, if that's how they look at these, uh, at these countries. I don't think the US is a menace, but you wanna make sure that this relationship uh, is sustained. Uh, and even if you go back to the Chicago World's Fair, it was just an enormous effort that was expended on it. Uh, and that effort paid uh, dividends. And I think we've all become a little bit lazy with the transatlantic relationship and need to think of it in terms of, uh, in terms of efforts uh, and, and indeed of cultural efforts, not just economic and, uh, and security ones. Uh, Michael, next I'd like to uh go back to this question of how the transmission belt from the world of ideas to the world of action. You served uh, for several years on the policy planning staff. Uh, uh, several uh, uh, characters in your book from Walt Rostow to, of course, Kennan to uh, people like Frank Fukuyama, uh, John Eikenberry and Anne-Marie Slaughter were all part of the policy planning staff. And, and we have a question um, uh, here from, sorry, I've just had it in front of me, from, from Sonia, uh, Michael or Michelle, sorry about the last name, but uh, she was asking um, about the relationship, as you see it, between the academy and the making of foreign policy. And this is something obviously you uh, experienced having been in the academy and going on to the, into the foreign policy world and how you see these ideas actually influencing policy. You mentioned in Saeed's case, perhaps it was very, very indirect, uh, uh, but but having having seen both sides of this, uh, what's your take on this? Well, um, you know, I think it's easy to, uh, to downplay ideas in the in the political sphere because there's always the crisis at the moment uh, and the churn uh, and all of that. But I do think, in, in my experience of policy planning, reinforced this that ideas are immensely uh, immensely important, uh, and the assumptions that we put behind them, the narratives that we develop from them. Uh, are really crucial, uh, maybe not to this policy or to that policy, but to the long-term success uh, of policies. And in that sense, if we go back to Kennan, uh, the way in which he constructed the Marshall Plan with others, uh, it was no accident, <laughs> the construction of the Marshall Plan, that it was such a good idea uh, and that it had such long-term uh, positive effects. It was the product of some very, very fine thinking uh, by Kennan. That's an easy case to make. There are lots of other uh, great policy planners, but uh, you know, I think that ideas are of the essence, uh, and it's wonderful that offices like the Office of Policy Planning exist to, uh, to sort of marshal them and to, uh, and to try to implement them. In a different sense, I think that universities have a role to play, and it's very complicated in a free society. So I think the last thing that the government should do is sort of hand universities a blueprint and say, go out and defend the West. I mean, we did that during the Cold War, uh, and it was kind of a catastrophic uh, a catastrophic mistake. Universities should do everything that they do. They should be critical. Uh, they should have a distance from government. Uh, they're definitely very different as institutions from government institutions. But I would also be happy to see my current world, the university world, contribute a little bit more uh, and think about what the dilemmas of policy are. Uh, think about what the West is at the moment. And if the university world doesn't like the West, what would be a better alternative? Uh, and sort of propose in the spirit uh, in the constructive spirit. I often feel the university world is just too uh, 
critical and sort of destructive and, uh, uh, and dismissive. So if my time at policy planning yielded anything, it was a sense that uh, uh, policy making is very, very hard and kind of needs all the help it can get. And I would like to see universities do more. Well, uh, speaking of policymaking, we have a question uh, from a distinguished uh, former policymaker, Hank Cohen, and he, he asks on, about economics and the question of whether economic interdependence in effect, in effect condemns the U.S. to engage in, in an ongoing effort to promote the concept of a democratic West. We've talked a lot about ideas. We've talked about architecture, uh, literature in this book. And you talked a little bit about economics in the context of Rostow's arguments, but could you talk a little bit more how you see economic interdependence playing in this idea of the West? Yeah, I, I'm not sure that economic interdependence uh, yields really much in terms of, uh, of, of democracy. It seems like there are multiple ongoing experiments now, um, not all of them unsuccessful, but sort of decouple economics from uh, you know, sort of values and, uh, uh, and democratic norms, some of those efforts coming from uh, Washington, D.C. at the moment. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure that there's any, any kind of inevitable connection between economic interdependence uh, and, uh, and democratic norms. But one could go back, perhaps, to the insight of Woodrow Wilson, uh, which was um, uh, not a pie-in-the-sky pie insight about the First World War, uh, you know, Wilson was less dreamy, I think, than we often think of him. And he acknowledged that the world was interdependent, uh, and he tried to sort of conceive of an American role uh, within that interdependence. I think that, you know, my book doesn't deal much with economics. I may not have that much personally to say about it. I think that I would understand economics as leverage, and we can use that leverage in a hundred different ways in this country. We can use it for good or for ill. Uh, we could use it to boost authoritarian regimes in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and elsewhere, or we could use it uh, for the sake of sort of expanding the perimeter uh, of democracy or uh, upholding the democratic alliances that we have. That choice, I think, resides with us, but I don't think that economic realities dictate all that much. It's, it's, it really is in our hands how we, how we use that leverage. Uh, Michael, I've got another question from a former policymaker, Price Floyd, uh, who's, this gets back to the issue of how what this current crisis uh, means for the future, but, but thinking about it from the perspective of how we got out of previous crises. So uh, what can we learn from uh, the lessons of the 20s and the 30s in terms of how we, quote unquote, got out of that, crisis, that crisis uh, for what the future may hold? Well, I, I can't see, at least by the standards of my book, too many great policy lessons from the U.S. in the 20s uh, and the 30s. I think that uh, I doubt we could have done otherwise, uh, in the sense that I doubt the U.S. would have intervened militarily in Europe in 1935 or, uh, or, or, or 1930. Uh, so maybe it was dictated by uh, necessity, but these are, of course, decades of, uh, of isolationism and I think uh, decades of policy failure eventually. Uh, on the American side, we didn't anticipate uh, the threats that were on the horizon. We didn't do enough. We were really uh, in pretty desperate straits in 1939 and even in 1941 uh, and had to catch up very uh, quickly. It's remarkable that we did, but uh, it doesn't speak really to the quality of uh, our policy making in the 20s and 30s. If we take the lessons uh, uh, of this period, you might want to focus more on the late 1940s. Uh, of course, that's a period when Nazi Germany and Japan have already been defeated, but uh, there's a Cold War on. Uh, and the U.S. was very capable at handling that particular problem set. Uh, it was able to anticipate the Soviet threat, was able not to overreact to the Soviet threat. That was uh, uh, a great skill, I think, in the end that, that Truman uh, and Eisenhower had. You know, containment really is a, uh, is a masterpiece of thinking about how to do enough without doing uh, too much. And then, of course, the multilateralism of those years. Um, what one misses, I don't want to speak in terms of nostalgia, but still what one misses from those periods is that sort of creative element. Let's create a NATO, let's create an international monetary fund, let's create a, uh, a new set of institutions. And it feels to me often like we, we in the West are sort of maintaining what we have, trying to keep it all running, uh, but I haven't seen too much creation. So in terms of policy lessons, I would focus on the creative phase, which is not the 20s and 30s, but uh, is certainly there in the, in the late 40s. Well, this gets to uh, another set of questions I want to get to. We've had several uh, uh, listeners ask about the role of, of geography in the concept of the West. And of course, there's been an ongoing debate going back to the uh, uh, certainly the post-war era, 
about which countries can be in the club or should be in the club. Uh, of course, now I think we have a more, much more expansive view of the West. Uh, uh, we've talked mainly in a transatlantic frame, but of course this includes uh, democratic allies now in Japan and Korea uh, and elsewhere. Um, this also gets to the question of institutions. You were just talking about institutions, whether uh, there are uh, institutions that, that continue to make the case for the West. NATO is the most obvious example. Um, but, but how do you see this, both the, both the question of geography and institutions in, in uh, reinvigorating this idea of the West? Well, um, if I were to speak in purely policy terms about the present, and not going to the history, I can go there in a second, but um, I think we should be as expansive as possible. Uh, we should certainly not limit our notion of the West to Northern Europe or Western Europe, uh, or really to Europe at all. Um, if this is a matter of sort of principles, of ideas, as I try to put it in the title, the history of an idea in American foreign policy, uh, it's certainly an idea that is open to all uh, and should be, uh, and that should be reflected in our institutional structures. So, uh, you know, NATO, uh, is, is a very, very good thing um, and it does tell this story, but we need to be, I think, at this stage more global than that uh, and think beyond the parameters of the traditional geographic West. But let me speak as a historian and sort of contradict myself in a sense. I just lionized these figures in the late 1940s who built these wonderful institutions and were creative and were excellent foreign policy practitioners, the Kennans and the Atchisons and others, and I do have great esteem for them, but they held a very narrow view of the West. You know, Italy was sort of half there. Uh, it was France, it was Germany, it was Britain. Forget about Spain, you know, you can include Portugal and NATO as a sort of semi-autocracy or as an autocracy because of Portugal. Those are sort of the lines in which they thought. And I can't resolve the question of whether their attitudes would seem uh, sort of dismissive to me and chauvinistic at times, if they were crucial to the creation of these institutions or if they were peripheral or perhaps even antithetical. I don't have an answer to that. But the story to me has to observe that previously American foreign policy makers were much more restrictive. We've opened our minds, uh, and I hope we can make good on that. Um, but in that sense, we can't just repeat what others did in the past. We have to uh, probably change the assumptions and change the thinking because the Dean Atchison's of the world were um, uh, in many ways sort of objectionable in the way that they limited, uh, limited the West to a narrow group of peoples and a narrow group of cultures. Well, I think this idea of, of opening our minds uh, is, a, is a good point to end on. And unfortunately, we are out of time. There's a lot of questions, Michael, we did not get a chance to, to get to. Uh, they're available in the chat. So perhaps you might wanna uh, take a look at those um, afterwards. Uh, thank you for this book. Uh, this is, it's a, is, I think this conversation shows it's, it's a thought provoking panoramic history that Michael Kimmich has written uh, about ideas and culture and uh, foreign policy. Um, normally, uh, in a book talk, this would be the point of the program where we would we would stop and everyone would line up and and Michael would sign some books. So, uh, what I want everyone to do is uh, to go uh, to bookshop.org or. Uh, uh, which is here in the United States or another uh, bookseller, uh, I would say go to a local bookseller, buy this book, and when we all come out of this mess that we're in and we can, we can see one another in person again, I'm sure Michael will be happy to sign the copies of the book. But this is a very thought-provoking read, uh, uh, and it's uh, both a, a provide deep insight into our past, but also, as Michael has suggested throughout this talk today, uh, some real optimism uh, for the future. So Michael, thank you for taking the time and thanks to everyone uh, who listened in or watched uh, this conversation. Thank you so much, Derek, for, for, for hosting and for making this possible. Absolutely. Thanks everybody. Thanks Have a great day. Thank you. Okay.